Okay, great. So in the last video, we thought about circumstances where we can essentially use the process of elimination to figure out one, one decision, right, one outcome that's going to make sense out of a strategic interaction, right, when two players know the other person's payoffs or when they don't. In other words, we found dominated strategies and dominant strategies. But what about situations where there is no clear dominant strategy, right, where my choices depend on your choices, your choices depend on my choices, and we can't rule any choices out. So as an example of this, let's imagine that after COVID is over and you're allowed to talk to your friends again, you and your friend decide that you want to meet up for lunch. But you make a mistake, neither of you say where you're going to meet, right? You all decide, you both decide you're going to meet up at noon, you just didn't say where. So you're trying to decide, do I go to the Tiger Cooler, do I go to the Marketplace? Your friend's also trying to decide, do I go to the Tiger Cooler or do I go to the Marketplace? Now let's say, some of you might have different food preferences than me, which is okay. But if you're like me, you might think that that kind of weird greasy pizza at Tiger Cooler is just the best thing in the world. So let's imagine that if your friends at the Tiger Cooler, going to the Tiger Cooler gives you a utility at 10. Whereas if your friends at the Marketplace, going to the Marketplace alongside your friend gives you a utility of let's say 5. Right? You like it, but you really want that greasy pizza. Now, at the same time, what you really care about more than anything else is getting to hang out with your friend. So if your friend was at the Tiger Cooler, being in the marketplace would be really sad, right? Let's give that a utility of three, right? And if your friend was at the marketplace, being at the Tiger Cooler, right, with your delicious greasy pizza, it's better than being in the marketplace alone, but we'll still give it a four, right? Now, from your friend's perspective, your friend also loves the Tiger Cooler and also loves you. So from your friend's perspective, being at the Tiger Cooler with you is also a 10. Being at the Marketplace when you're at the Tiger Cooler, super sad. That's going to be a 1 for your friend. They really like you. It's nice. And being at the Tiger Cooler when you're at the Marketplace is going to have a payoff of, let's say, 1 for them as well. They really miss you. They really want your company. Being at the Marketplace alongside you, let's give that a 6. Great. Right, so we've got a set of payoffs. We've got a set of choices. Let's think about what we'll do. So first of all, let's find our best responses. So let's say you knew for sure your friend was going to be at the Tiger Cooler, right? You get a text saying, hey, I'm at the Tiger Cooler. Where are you? What's your best move there? Well, you'll get a 10 if you go to the Tiger Cooler, a 3 if you go to the Marketplace. So your best move is going to be to go to the Tiger Cooler. How about if your friend is at the Marketplace, right? Send the text saying, hey, I'm at the Marketplace. Well, you're going to decide, do I prefer a 4 or a 5? You prefer a 5. So you'll reluctantly leave your greasy pizza, go to the Marketplace. So, I want to point out here, no dominant strategy, no dominated strategy, right? Your best move is going to depend entirely on what your friend does. Now let's think about your friend. So, if your friend knows that you're going to be the Tiger Cooler, they'll get a 10 if they go to the cooler, a 1 if they go to the marketplace, best move is going to be to go to the cooler, right? And if they know you're going to be at the marketplace, they're going to say, well, I'm going to be happier at the marketplace than sadly eating alone at the cooler, so their best move will be to the marketplace. So again, for them, there's no dominant strategy, right? What they want to do depends entirely on what you want to do. So can we say anything at all about what is going to come out of this game, right? We certainly can't assert that you're both going to end up in the cooler or that you're both going to end up in the marketplace because, my goodness, right? Your choices depend on your friend. Your friend's choices depend on you. But there is something that we can say. What we can say is, if you know that your friend's going to be the Tiger Cooler, and if your friend knows that you're going to be at the Tiger Cooler, neither of you will have any reason to break your plan and go to the Marketplace. Right? And if we knew that you were going to be the Marketplace, and that your friend was going to be the Marketplace, neither of you would have any reason to break your plan and go to the Cooler. In other words, we can say that 
once there exists, right, once you both expect to be at the Tiger Cooler, you'll both be at the Tiger Cooler. If you both expect the other to be at the marketplace, you'll be at the marketplace. We'll call this a Nash equilibrium. Named after the um, economist mathematician John Nash, who's the inventor of game theory. Essentially, what, or one of the most important you know, people responsible for game theory. And a Nash equilibrium is going to be some set of choices where if both players know what the other player will do, neither has a reason to deviate from the plan. In other words, we know that being at the Tiger Cooler, both of you being at the Tiger Cooler, is a Nash equilibrium, because if I expect you to be there and you expect me to be there, neither of us are going to deviate. Right? We don't know which of these two plans will happen, because once any plan is in place, neither one of us will unilaterally move away to the other plan. Now, one thing you might be wondering about is, we say that both of these are Nash equilibrium. Right, both of these are possible outcomes. You might be thinking, well, why would you guys end up both being the marketplace? Right? Can't we rule this out? Because there's a better Nash equilibrium. Now, in the case of two people who are friends, we certainly hope so. Right? We'd hope that you'd have good enough communication so that you could both avoid eating at the place that you like worse. Although, let's be real, this has happened to all of us. But if we think about bigger societal problems, we might very easily end up in a situation where all of us have a reason to stick with a bad outcome because we can't collectively decide, collectively understand each other well enough to move to something that's better for all of us. So one of my favorite examples of this is um, back in like the early 1900s, the way that tenement buildings were built is a lot of times people would have air shafts in their apartments near the kitchen. So essentially to say, right, if you've got the, um, you know, building with a couple hundred apartments, you basically have a column um, down, through the, down through the apartment building that's just air so that people have a window, right? So people can have some amount of ventilation. They don't suffocate in their apartments. And the problem is people would throw garbage out of the air shaft, right? Because it's a little easier than taking it downstairs. And once there's some garbage in the air shaft, nobody's going to want to keep their windows open to the air shaft because it smells horrible in there, right? There's only a little bit of rotten garbage it takes before you don't want to leave your window open. So if you're not going to keep your window open anyway, you might as well throw your garbage down the air shaft too. Right, so when we think about this sort of problem, we might think that for each person, they would rather have well-ventilated apartments with fresh air and their windows open than the convenience of throwing garbage down their air shaft. But only if they think that all their neighbors are also going to avoid throwing garbage down their air shaft. Right, if you've got a building with 100 people and any one of them could get us into the garbage equilibrium, right, where we're keeping our, our windows closed anyway, so we might as well throw our garbage down the air shaft, we might easily end up in the bad Nash equilibrium, right? The everyone throws garbage equilibrium, even though every single person would prefer the nobody throws garbage equilibrium. And even though if we could get to the nobody throws garbage equilibrium, we would stay there, right? No individual person, no individual family would ever decide to throw garbage down a pristine air shaft if they expected all their neighbors wouldn't do the same thing. Okay, great. Let's do one more example. So let's imagine that Warner Brothers and Universal are both deciding what blockbuster movie they're going to try to make in time for Christmas. And each of them is going to decide, do I want to make an action movie? Do I want to make a rom-com? Right? So WB, decide rom-com or action. Right? Universal, same thing, right? Rom-com. Or action. And let's say that they've got payoffs. Like the following. So let's say for WB, we've got payoffs of five, seven, nine, and five. 
And for universal, we've got payoffs of 6, 10, 7, and 3. Great. Okay. So what we want to know, right, is given these payoffs, what can we say about which movies are going to be made by which companies? Well, what we'll do, right, is we'll figure out each company's best response to each of the other company's possible moves. So if I'm Warner Brothers, I say, well, what would I do if I knew that Universal was going to make a rom-com? Well, rather than deciding do I want to make $5 million or $7 million, clearly I'm going to be better off making an action movie, right? It's going to have a higher payoff. How about if I knew that Universal was going to make an action movie? Well, then I'd make $9 million from a rom-com and $5 million from an action movie. So clearly my best move is going to be to make a rom-com. How about if I'm Universal? Well, if I know that Warner Brothers is going to make a rom-com, right, I'm going to be better off making an action movie, right? Seven's higher than six. But if I knew that Warner Brothers was going to make an action movie, right, then I'm going to be better off making a rom-com because ten's better than three. So in this case, we again have two Nash equilibria, right? We can't rule out either of these two strategies for either of these two players, right? We can't say for sure whether Warner Brothers will make an action movie or a rom-com or whether Universal will make an action movie or a rom-com. But what we do know is that if Warner Brothers knew that Universal was going to make an action movie, Warner Brothers would make a rom-com, and Universal would stick with making the action movie. Right? In other words, once Universal announces action, both players are going to choose something that's compatible with the other person's choices. Right? So this is going to be an Nash equilibrium here. This is going to be an Nash equilibrium here. Likewise, right, if Universal announced that they were making a rom-com, Warner Brothers announced they were making an action movie, both players would stick with the announcements that they made. Now, another thing to note here, right, is that in this case, both players would prefer to be the ones making the rom-com, right? Warner Brothers would make $9 million from a rom-com, $7 million from an action. Universal would make $10 million from a rom-com, $7 million from the action. So both of them will have an incentive to insist that they're the ones making the rom-com, Right, and try to bully the other company into choosing the, the Nash equilibrium right, of these two possibilities that works better for them. So we can't say for sure which is going to win that exchange. Right? Who's going to have the first mover advantage is going to be able to assert the equilibrium they want. But we do know that once they can credibly claim that they're working on a rom-com, their competitor will agree to work on an action. One final note about Nash equilibrium. Any strategy that's dominant, right, any time that we can use dominance or iterated dominance to find some st outcome strategy, that strategy has got to be a Nash equilibrium. Nash equilibrium is a weaker concept than domination because it can't tell us for sure what's going to happen. It can just tell us whether any particular outcome is stable. In other words, once an outcome is determined or decided, expected by everyone, whether everyone will play along. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much.